and uh, last two presentations will deal with uh, very, let's go ahead and set up your uh, brave choice of the project. So it deals with the situation when change of electronic state and change of the state of the vibrational motion are taking place in a concerted way, similar to what our seminar speaker Sharon Hamas Schiffer was uh, presenting. Okay, so this approach, this view is a big challenge for theory and it does contribute to understanding of uh, several spectroscopic phenomena like uh, Stokes shift profiles of the spectra on one hand. On other hand, it is uh, a more advanced tool to predict uh, rates of charge transfer when uh, one goes from excited to charge transfer state and it was uh, this approach was based for uh, uh, so-called Marcus. We can probably put switch off all lights and then see something at least. Okay, Maria, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Um, as Dr. Kill was saying, uh, my topic's about Marcus theory and in particular the effect of initial kinetic energy and polarity on electronic transfer in the system, uh, and polarity diet. Um, so why should should we study quark and polarity diet? Well, um, they have a number of potential uses, but what makes them truly special as donor acceptor systems is that they have um, very low reorganization energies, uh, similar to even natural photosynthetic uh, systems. So that's what makes them special. So jumping right into the model, um, I set up two different potentials. The top potential represents the excited charge transfer state, and that lower potential um, here represents the ground state. Um, we're looking at the transfer from the excited charge transfer state down to the ground state. So we're going to start in the excited state. Um, we, uh, for starting off, I determine the number of parameters, and I got most of these parameters from an article by Wiemannen, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right, and his group. Um, they did a number of studies using um, time resolved fluorescent spect spectroscopy, and they determined the intensity of that fluorescence as a function of frequency, and they fitted that um, to this equation here. And as you can see, um, there's a number of highlighted Marcus theory parameters, so those are that's the basis for the parameters that I used was their work. The initial wave function I used um, was based off of this equation, very similar to what the rest of the class has been using. Um, I propagated it based off of this idea, where you have the wave function and an evolution operator, which will push that uh, wave function forward in time, starting here and then moving forward. Um, my system is a little more complicated than this kind of theoretical one um, because of the transfer process going on because there's two potentials. So um, my wave equation is actually based on uh, some sum of two different nuclear wave functions. One is in that first state, the excited state, and then the second one is in the ground state, which we'll call state two for the rest of the presentation. Now to propagate these in time, you have to multiply them by the evolution operator, first of all, and then you also have to have a term taking into account the interaction energy between the first and the second state. So when I ran this wave function with a certain amount of initial kinetic energy, what I discovered is that, um, as would be anticipated, the initial wave function, um, the blue one, only is in that first state, so that it's only in the excited state. And there's none of the um, yellow-orange one, which is, represents the wave function in the ground state, state two, um, at the initial time. However, as you move your wave packet past the point where those two potentials cross, you start to see a little bit of that, um, that second wave function emerge. Now, this, this process occurs in kind of a step-like pattern. Every time you cross that uh, potential crossing, you get a sudden jump in the probability of transfer. So as you cross that, you jump, and then as you transverse the rest of the, um, the, rest of the field, then you get a, a plane, and then uh, each time it crosses this point, then you get an increase in the probability of transfer. Here's a, a longer time, time scale um, 
seeing that you transfer electrons down to the ground state and then there's a possibility that they transfer back. Um, another thing I'd like to draw your attention to is the time scale on this. Um, this process is occurring in about 120 femtoseconds. So that's in sub picosecond range, so it's really fast. Another way of visualizing this is um, here. Uh, here's the, uh, on the left side we have time, and on the bottom there's um, position. So again, here's the ground state, and as you can see over time, the intensity of that color, it, it brightens, <coughs> indicating that electrons being trans electron density is being transferred from the excited state down into that ground state. As you can see, it started here with not only the blue in the excited state, but as you move past this crossing point, you got a little bit of the yellow-orange um, in the ground state. And as we move past that uh, potential crossing here again, you'll see that um, this yellow increases in proportion to the blue again. So um, I also studied, like most of my other classmates, the effect of the initial kinetic energy on uh, how much electron, uh, electron, uh, how well that electron was transferred, um, electron density was transferred. Uh, so starting off, when you have not enough kinetic energy to push it past that potential crossing point, there's not enough energy to get over that activation barrier, then you're not going to have a lot of electron transfer. However, past that, um, there's kind of a peak. Um, that's due to two competing effects. In one effect, the more times you cross that potential crossover, um, the more time you spend in there, the greater your electron transfer process will occur. However, um, after a certain point, your kinetic energy is so great that you don't spend a lot of time at that um, crossover point, so you just don't get as much electron transfer because it's moving too quickly. So that's why you see that peak there, and then it comes down. I also studied the effect of solvent on electron transfer probability. Um, these parameters are, again, based off the work done by Beeman and found the Marcus, parameter, uh, Marcus theory parameters for these. Um, there's two non-polar solvents and then a couple of the um, moderately polar solvents. And as you can see, going from the non-polar solvents into the moderately pol polar solvents, the uh, maximum electron transfer, the rate of that electron transfer really jumps up. So in conclusion, um, the rate of electron transfer for this model, poor frame fullerene diet, is in the sub-picosecond range. It's really a fast process. Um, when the initial kin kinetic energy is less than the activation energy, there is very little electron transfer going on, which could be expected. And then when we're past that activation energy, when you have a higher kinetic energy, you have those two competing um, effects, the number of times it crosses, the, that potential crossing, versus the amount of time it spends there. So that's why you see that peak. Um, solvent with medium polarities were more conducive to electron transfer than low polarity solvents with the system. I want to thank Dr. Keelan <laughs> for you know, helping me out to figure out all this and thank all of you for uh, your time and listening. Okay, thank you, Maria. So, questions are very welcome. No, after the figure, I ought to ask something. <laughs> so, uh, in your models, in your potential energy surface, the crossing point, the magic point when the transfer occurs, was very far to the left of the equilibrium position. If you would create a molecule and you would be able to set up the crossing point anywhere you like, which position of this crossing point would provide the quickest transfer? Um. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's right. Can you comment for it? Um, because this would be at the lowest point, it would require less energy to shift. The only thing, um, another way to do the shift back is Okay. Any any other? So, Maria, right? right now uh, describe main point of the uh, Nobel holder Marcus discovery about the electron transfer. Um, I do have a question. So you have a fairly complex multi-nuclear system, so what is the meaning of your displacement force? Yeah. I mean, along, you're comparing those two 
Right. Um, so, what 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 is? How are you defining the axis of displacement? I I guess it, the axis of displacement. In order to, it implies there's different equilibrium configurations for the two states, right? So along what, what axis is that? I guess I don't know the, the particular axis. Um, I, the, the numbers are arbitrary. I could have started at 5 million and gone to like 5 million and 30. Um, this value, however, was de determined based on the, um, the outer sphere and inner sphere reorganization energy so, so that distance is actually based on experimental parameters, but these numbers here are arbitrary. So your answer is that definition of reaction coordinate is a challenging task. <laughs> it's probably multi-dimensional as well. Um, it's probably not all the same. Can I try helping? Uh, well, it is not an answer. It is uh, just an one of the arguments. If it is a multi uh, multi-dimensional space, and there are two equilibrium points in this multi-dimensional space, then one can make a multi-dimensional straight line that connects these two points, and any motion along this point can be considered as reaction coordinate change. Okay. So more questions to the speaker. If not, let's thank Mariah once again. And we need to have 